Okay. okay, everyone. Well, thank you again for joining us. I apologize about the brief delay. Um, we are going to record the lecture, so I am going to email it to everybody afterwards. Um, so if you have any additional questions or if you need to forward it to anybody else that may benefit, you can do that as well. Um, but again, I just want to thank everybody for joining. Um, I hope everyone is continuing to stay safe and get back to somewhat of a normal, normal schedule. Uh, we do normally hold these lectures in person, but obviously under the circumstances, we've been doing a lot of virtual lectures and they've been um, very helpful and a lot of people have been finding them beneficial. So I hope you do as well. Um, our lecture today will be given by Dr. Michael Smith. Dr. Michael Smith is a neurosurgeon specializing in the care and surgical management of spine conditions. He's worked as, as a specialist in spinal surgery, um, neurosurgery in New York City since 2008. He initially started his practice at Monte Fiore Medical Center as an assistant professor of neurosurgery at Albert Einstein College of Medicine until 2009, and then transitioned to NYU Medical Center as an assistant professor of neurosurgery, NYU School of Medicine, until joining Rothman Orthopedics last year in 2019. Um, he currently sees patients at our offices in Manhattan at our, at our locations in Gramercy and Mary Hill. Um, his topic he will be speaking on today is lumbar disc herniation with or without weakness. Um, I do want to ask everybody if you have any questions to type them into the chat section at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then Dr. Smith will get to all questions and answers at the end of his lecture. And also another reminder, if you can just keep your phone on mute so we just don't um, cause any interruptions during the lecture. Um, okay, Dr. Smith, you want to take it from here? Thank you, Jen. And again, I apologize for being late. I just was finishing up my morning office hours. Um, thank you all for being here. So I'm going to talk about a very common problem, uh, lumbar disc herniations, how we evaluate them and how we manage them. Um, and again, uh, I work at Rothman Orthopedics of New York. I uh, see patients in Manhattan. We operate at the uh, uh, Lenox Hill Hospital for those people who do need surgery. Now, herniated lumbar discs are a very common problem. Um, uh, one to three percent what we call prevalence, meaning if you just MRI people walking down the street, like uh, uh, one or three, one to three percent of people would have herniated disc that which may be symptomatic. Uh, and five to 20 per 1,000 adults will, will herniate a disc in a year. Uh, it's most common actually in the sort of the uh, middle kind of time, 30 to 50 years. Um, actually a little less, pretty uncommon in, in children. Uh, and actually not as common in elderly populations, a little more common male than female, and most of them are at those bottom two levels of the spine, L4, 5, L5, S1, because that's really where the, most of the, the weight is. That's the base of the spine. But only about 10% of herniated lumbar discs will actually need surgery. So if the main problem is just is pain, you can do a lot of things to control pain, uh, narcotics if needed, but also a lot of like non-narcotic anti-inflammatory pain medications, oral steroids, uh, a period of rest if you're having an acute episode of pain or a referral to physical therapy to help with core and lower extremity, strengthening and flexibility type exercises. And then as an uh, invasive option, an epidural steroid injection, um, uh, but uh, you know, minimally invasive option that can be done by a rehab doctor or, or a pain management doctor. Uh, in some cases, though, if a herniated disc is bad and really severely compressing a nerve, you can have uncontrollable pain where actually doing a surgery to go in and remove that herniated disc uh, to take pressure off the nerve may be a good option. So if you have uncontrolled pain or an even more concerning thing, if you have weakness in the leg, uh, then that could be an area, uh, those, those are times when we may be thinking about surgery um, to take the pressure off the nerve to stop that ongoing injury to the nerve. Now, a big debate in spinal surgery has been, well, you know, how effective is surgery versus non-operative care? Um, is doing surgery quickly or, or, or early uh, better than waiting? Because we know that a significant percent of herniated disc will get better with time. Uh, so we don't want to, you know, if every person who herniated disc and had some leg pain came into the OR and got rushed off to the operating room, we'd be doing too many surgeries because a majority, 75, 80% of those people will be better in three, four, six weeks with some time, some rest, physical therapy, and some medication. So we don't want to operate on a bunch of people who are going to be better anyway, just through the what we call the natural history, basically the body healing the herniated disc. You may say, well, how does a herniated disc heal? Well, in fact, the herniated disc, it's, it's, it's not like a fluid. It's almost like, like a crab meat kind of material. Um, and if you've eaten a, a crab, that, that it's got texture, but it's soft. And so the body can actually reabsorb that, shrink it down, 
And so as the uh, disc herniation shrinks down, the pressure on the nerve goes down, and so people can get better without having a surgery. And that's the reason to do non-operative treatment is to let the, give the body a chance to heal on its own. So then there's a subgroup of people who don't get better with non-operative treatment or have such severe symptoms, pain or, or weakness, um, or even bad numbness that you're concerned that the nerve's being damaged. So there have been a number of studies over the years trying to figure out, well, who should have surgery and who does surgery really help? Um, there's a big trial called the SPORT trial, where they randomized patients with or without surgery. Um, but the reality is actually studying this kind of problem is really uh, difficult uh, to do in a really perfect way because patients are all different. Somebody's in severe pain and been told they can't have surgery may need to have surgery. Somebody who is told they should have surgery but they feel better may not want to have surgery. So this, like most studies, it has some limitations. And not to be too, too not to get into too much detail, but uh, if you, as you can see on this screen, of all the patients who could have been enrolled, they only actually enrolled 75%, uh, 25% of the patients, which means that up to 75% of the patients may have decided you know, decided not to enroll because they didn't want to be told they were going to have surgery or not. They may be in such severe pain that they knew they wanted surgery and didn't want to risk being enrolled. Or their pain was kind of tolerable, and so they weren't going to be sign up to possibly be told they need surgery. And even of those people who actually ended up enrolling in the study, 60% of people who were told they should have surgery didn't have surgery, and 45% who told they you know, said, oh, you're non-surgical, ended up having surgery. So in the end, you can have what's called the intention to treat, like, oh, we told you you're not having surgery, and analyze it that way, but that doesn't make a lot of sense when so many people flip over. In terms of actually as treated, so you know, if you had surgery, didn't have surgery, people who had surgery actually did a lot better. Although by two years after surgery, a lot of people were better anyway because the non-operative people often kind of got better through natural healing if their symptoms weren't so bad that they needed surgery. And so in the end, it's you know, the question is how do you use this information to actually counsel a patient or guide a patient? You know, because they're not statistics; they're patients. Um, some more studies that have been, you know, uh, done, uh, this is looking like, well, what if you come in with what we call a foot drop, right? Your, your ankle's weak, you can't lift your foot up. That's a big problem because if we, you know, that can make it hard to walk, you can trip, you know, risk for falls. Um, and actually, and that is something that will push us towards doing surgery earlier. And, you know, in this particular study, they found actually a 75% rate of full recovery in a year after doing a discectomy. 15% partial improvement, only 10% made no improvement. They didn't look at how quickly or how quickly the surgery was done, but did give a very hopeful um, uh, response in that, in fact, many people actually can get better. This is a big confusing slide, but this basically saying like all these different scientific studies that have been done, um, looking for things to predict who's gonna do well from surgery or not do well from surgery, who should have surgery, uh, they give conflicting data, all the studies have limitations. Um, and this thing down next to the star where I say conclusion, they say a, a low risk of bias perspective study is needed to further investigate because all the current evidence is low or very low level, but it's easy to write that. The problem is it's essentially an impossible thing to do. We do know overall from overall studies and um, looking at this that if you take the pressure off the nerve sooner uh, you, you, you seem to, you have a better chance of making good recovery. So if the nerve is compressed for a long time, there's a bigger chance it's going to have a permanent damage um, and then therefore not be able to actually recover. Uh, maybe persisting pain, uh, the strength never coming back or having an area of numbness that's permanent. And so in this study, they said, well, if, you have if your symptoms are less than two months, then the nerve is less likely to be permanent damage. You're likely to do better. This is a study from the United Kingdom. Um, again, a lot of detail on the slide, but basically uh, the uh, 16 of 18 patients who had symptoms only for less than four weeks made a complete recovery, whereas those patients who waited like 18 weeks had very few of them made a good recovery. So getting a, a compressed nerve decompressed soon is a good approach when you've got significant symptoms. Um, the worse, the, the longer you wait and the more severe the weakness is before surgery, the less likely that the nerve is, uh, is able to recover. So I, again, we have, um, 
we have the general concept that there's a lot of people who have herniated discs who have relatively tolerable symptoms that can be managed with some anti-inflammatories or steroids <clears throat> or physical therapy. And those aren't the people we're talking about because we wouldn't jump to surgery for those people. Give them time to heal. This is the group of people who have the uncontrolled pain or the significant weakness in a muscle group in their leg where we where where that's a more urgent situation where we're more concerned saying this person is at a as a risk has a significant risk of a of a permanent what we call neurologic deficit you know never fully recovering because their nerve is damaged and so where we'll think about surgery earlier and this data does show that in those more severe cases uh, patients will do better if you get their nerves decompressed and protected sooner um, again and this just gets back to the problem with some of the studies. Who wants to be randomized? If you're suffering from a, a herniated disc and you're in severe pain, are you going to sign up for a study where they say, well, you might or might not be able to have the best treatment for you and you won't have a choice because you're in a study and you're being told what is going to happen. And so a lot of patients don't want to do that. They say, well, I can't live with this pain. I can't walk. I need this fixed. I'm not signing up for your study. And that's always going to be a problem. So the, the studies, the data are always going to be limited. Um, and we always, as a, as a physician, either a surgical doctor like me or like my non-operative colleagues, rehab doctors, pain management doctors, we still have to treat the patient in front of us and say, well, you as an individual with your problem, what's going to be better for you? And some people are obviously not in need of surgery and other people obviously need surgery. And then there's that gray zone where clinical judgment on the doctor's part and the patient's own perspective and personality play a big role in determining what's the best path forward for that individual. Um, what is the surgery? Um, I thought this would be interesting to look at something other than just papers and studies. Um, the great thing about herniated lumbar discs is that they can almost always be treated with small microscope, minim, uh, mini open or minimally invasive surgeries. So as opposed to big fusion surgeries where you're putting in screws and rods and, and which is an important tool for people with other problems, when you have a herniated disc, it's a very specific target that we can use um, x-ray to localize exactly where that is, bring down uh, what are called minimally invasive retractor tubes like you can see in the top right picture. Um, and through a, uh, a one inch incision, do a one hour surgery with the surgical microscope you can see on the bottom right um, to separate the nerve from the herniated disc, uh, get the nerve protected, pull out the fragments of herniated disc, make sure the nerves decompressed and closed up. The, the great majority, 95% or more people who have a lumbar microdiscectomy go home same day. Uh, we're doing many of these actually not even in hospitals, but in ambulatory surgical centers because you don't need a hospital. And especially during this time of uh, COVID, where you know there have been a lot of patients with COVID in the hospital, we you know really were looking at non-hospital facilities, ambulatory surgical centers, where we could take care of patients needing these type of surgeries, clean surgeries, you know, who weren't medically ill. Now, fortunately, in New York, we have a very low rate actually of COVID patients, even in our hospitals, like Lenox Hill Hospital, where I worked, which three months ago was taking care of a lot of these patients were down to single digits of these patients. And it's been going down with the, the proper precautions that we've been taking in the New York area. Um, Post-operatively, you know, you go home same day, we send you home with a few Percocets, which you should really be off of in a few days, although everybody's different. Um, no bending, lifting, twisting for the first few weeks because you want to minimize the risk of re-injuring yourself in that area that needs to heal up and scar in and get strong again. And then depending on how you're doing, some people we send for, out, for outpatient uh, physical therapy, outpatient rehab, many patients don't even need it because when I see them back at their two-week or six-week visit, their, their pain's better, their foot's stronger, they're walking around, they're doing the things they want to do. Uh, some people like to do rehab and physical therapy. Others say, look, I know, you know, I'm going to do some stretching on my own. I'll call if I need you. I feel great. Thanks, doc. And I don't want to go to rehab, you know, therapy twice a week. So some people, some people it's good for and some people it's not great for. This is a, a real case of mine, a little bit uh, more complicated in the sense that I had done this minimally invasive fusion. Um, you can see the screws and the rods there at L3, L4, and L5. And he had some chronic back pain. We fixed his main problem years ago. 
uh, and then I saw him, I think it was just before COVID, uh, and he had two weeks of a new severe right leg pain, pain going down through his calf to the bottom of his foot, which is what we call the S1 nerve pattern. And his right calf muscle, his gastroc, uh, his gastroc muscle was weak. He couldn't actually raise his heel off the, uh, off the floor, uh, which gave him significant ambulatory uh, dysfunction. Um, so that is a pretty classic story for a herniated disc. Uh, and so we got him an MRI urgently. And you can see where I've got the arrow. Uh, and actually, I can't see my arrow to show you. But where there's an old chronic dark disc herniation and then a new fragment of herniated disc, which was compressing his um, S1 nerve root. Uh, you can see on the top left is a side view of the MRI. The two right images are looking down the spinal canal and there's a big herniated disc compressing the nerve. Uh, so we did surgery and that picture there is actually in the operating room, all this big fragment of herniated disc that we took out, you can see the centimeter ruler there, how much disc herniation was in there pushing on the nerve. And in his two week visit, uh, he already had a substantial improvement, not complete, but substantial improvement in his calf strength. His right leg pain was gone, not taking any pain medications and his walking was returning to normal. Now this is a gentleman, it's a little bit older too, and with the leg weakness, who, who we did refer to physical therapy um, because he is somebody who's gonna need a little bit of help really optimizing his recovery. Uh, and and that's, my, that's the presentation I have uh, set up. And so I think, Jen, now we can do some, uh, 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 some question and answers if we have some. Okay, thank you, Dr. Smith. So again, if, if anybody has any questions, feel free to type it into the chat section um, at the bottom of the screen. I just wrote a, a little note in there, type any of your questions in there. Um, or if you like, you can unmute yourself and ask the question out loud. <clears throat> Doctor, one question for you. Can you hear me? Yes. So <clears throat> I, I'm on steroids. I'm on the prednisone uh, pack. And is there any studies that say that after you finish the prednisone pack with an L4, L5 herniated disc, that there's a high percentage of the pain will be eliminated or it'll come back or what happens when you're off the steroid? So it's a, it's a, a great question and there's a wide range of response to steroids. So the idea of, a, of oral steroids, simple to take, as so long as you're not diabetic or have other medical risk factors, uh, relatively safe. Um, the idea is that when there's a herniated disc pushing on the nerve, part of the pain uh, is from the actual compression of the nerve. Now, steroids are not really going to help that. But the other part of the pain is actually the inflammation. So the herniated disc material is irritating to the nerve. It's in, there's inflamed. There's a bunch of chemical react, uh, signals that get passed that create inflammation in the nerve. And actually, when you do surgery, the nerve is red and swollen. And so at this... Uh, steroids, which can be prednisone or something called a medrol dose pack or de dexamethasone, uh, their job is to cut that inflammatory process. Uh, and there are some people who really have more of a nerve irritation and not as much nerve compression who get a dramatic response to the steroids. And, and those are people who often typically will not need to go onto, onto surgery because once you take down the inflammation and the body can heal over time and the nerve was never that severely compressed to start with. When they, but in some of those cases, cause often you'll have like a six or seven or 10 day course of steroids, but your doctor probably puts you on a descent, like a taper. So a higher dose, lower dose, lower dose, lower dose. Some people will find that they feel better on the steroids for the two reasons. One, the anti-inflammatory effect helps the nerve. Two, steroids make a lot of people feel better, like just a little high, like it's an upper. And so then when you finish the steroids, if the inflammation, if the herniated disc is still there, causing inflammation of the nerve, uh, the symptoms can come back. And, then, and so it's not uncommon for people I see, which is the select group of people who aren't doing well with just medications, for instance. They'll say, yeah, I felt pretty good for three or four days, but you know, two days after the steroids stopped, the pains all came back. And what that tells you is there's really ongoing compression uh, or even injury to the nerve uh, that a, a steroid pill alone isn't going to help. Now, an epidural steroid injection does the same thing. It's just a higher dose right on the nerve. So the downside is you have to go to an office under x-ray, get a needle put into the spine. And so it's a procedure versus just a simple pill. But the advantage of it 
is it's a higher dose right on the nerve and less dose in your body. So, uh, you know, long, taking steroids by mouth for a long time can have negative effect, but usually seven to 10 days of steroids are pretty safe for most people. Was that, that was, did that help? Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any questions? Yes, doctor. Uh, what was the effectiveness of a medication such as a gabapentin? Uh, good question. Uh, gabapentin or a similar drug called uh, that, which is Neurontin or a sim similar drug called Lyrica are both nerve stabilizing drugs as opposed to pain drugs. And they can like, they, they can give, um, they can help some people who have ongoing nerve pains. Now, if the nerve is severely compressed and inflamed, they don't tend to be dramatically effective, although sometimes they can be helpful in what's called a multimodal approach. So if you have a course of steroids, some narcotic or maybe non-narcotic pain medication, and the Neurontin or Lyrica, that all those together can you know, could take you from like a nine out of 10 pain down to a five out of 10 pain uh, without relying just on high doses of narcotics, which of course in the modern era, we're all trying to minimize narcotic use. And that's where the steroids and just simple Tylenol and, and uh, Neurontin uh, can be helpful adjuncts uh, to help control the pain without resorting to a narcotic. Uh, it, it can also be helpful after surgery sometimes when if the nerve's been injured and you take the pressure off the nerve, uh, but there's ongoing nerve symptoms like some people have like burning or tingly kind of nerve reawakening symptoms and that can be minimized sometimes with a medication like Neurontin or Lyrica uh, because again what they do is actually stabilize the nerve uh, the actual membrane of the nerve so it just decreases its reactivity and how much it's short circuiting if you want to think of it that way so is that is that helpful yes very much thank you Anybody else? Any questions? Dr. Smith, we had one question come in the chat. I don't know if you see that. How many injections would you have to do? Just one and done? Um, yeah, for some reason I can't see my chat box. Um, so in the pain management and rehab docs will generally use as a general rule up to three. Um, they don't like doing more than three injections, partly because you're starting to get a lot of steroid. And also if, if it hasn't worked at that point, it's probably not going to work. Um, and people's responses to injections are, are very widely. Again, partly if you, if your nerves not severely compressed, it's just inflamed and you get a shot right in that sweet spot, right on the nerve, it can give dramatic relief. Uh, but what'll happen sometimes is then you'll feel better for two or three weeks and the symptoms will come back because that herniated disc is still there, still causing inflammation and the steroids worn off. So you can get a second one, um, which may give additional relief. Um, and then even potentially a third one if it comes back. Now the rationale again is you're not, the injection is not fixing the nerve, the, the disc herniation. It's just trying to keep the nerve cooler and less pain, less symptoms while the body is shrinking that disc herniation down um, and letting the actual underlying problem heal up. So sometimes people have like the first injection that gets them down to here. The second injection gets their pain down to here and maybe a third injection really get it down. I and mean, there are other people who only have one. And there are other people who get absolutely no response to any injections, no matter how many they do. And that's because the nerve is just so severely compressed that there's really no chance that squirting steroid in there is gonna do anything. And, and the only option really then, the effective option is to do a surgery to physically take the pressure off the nerve, make space for the nerve, and then allow the nerve to heal. Okay, anybody else have any other questions? If any other questions come up, you could always feel free to email me directly and I will work with Dr. Smith on getting those questions answered for you. Um, but again, I did record the presentation, so I will send it out to everyone um, after this. Um, again, if anybody joined us late, Dr. Michael Smith sees patients at our offices in Manhattan and our locations in Gramercy and Mary Hill. I did and send the, phone, the scheduling phone number in the chat section, but I will also send it out in the email um, that I sent out to everyone with the recording of the presentation as well. 
But if we do not have any other questions, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Hope everyone continues to stay safe. And again, if you have any other questions that come up, please feel free to email me directly and I will work to get them answered. Yeah, thank, thank you for setting this up and I uh, appreciate everybody who showed up today. Again, I apologize for being a little late getting out of the finishing up with my patients this morning. Great. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.